about 18, 20 months into this gig now, I can tell you that we are leaders. And a lot of that has to do with people that are in this room, the folks who are on this panel, and Clean Tech San Diego. You know, my interest in this is that it's, you know, well, I'm, not, I'm a human being in the world, so there's that part. Um, <laughs> as you see, two of uh, my uh, cities that I have the honor of representing are here, which is a way of saying that this district really demands uh, climate action. Uh, and that work uh, I try to do on the city council level, but really continuing it at the statewide level. Uh, some of you, I mean, I'm sure all of you are familiar. Uh, Governor Brown on Monday signed Senate Bill 100, committing California to 100% renewable energy by 2045. I would point out that the city of San Diego made a similar commitment three years, three, four years ago, um, to do it by 2035. So for everyone, and you know, rightly the governor and I think the legislature are allotted for taking this step and, and laying this chip on the table, uh, but we should be proud as a region uh, that we uh, had our largest city make that commitment. And since that time, great cities like Long <coughs> Beach and La Mesa, uh, Del Mar, I'm certainly missing some, uh, but many more have signed on as well. So we're building uh, a coalition, uh, an entire region that was really focused on this, pioneering uh, some of the technologies that will help us get this done. Uh, and I love telling that story up in Sacramento. That was a part of the way we passed SB 100. It wasn't a question of a state mandate coming down on local, local communities. In my case, three of the five cities I already represent, that I represent, already signed themselves up for this. Um, so I, I, I'm glad, to, I'm happy to be here this morning to tell the story of San Diego's leadership on this. Uh, and really invite more folks uh, who uh, maybe are outside of our community uh, to come to San Diego and help us implement this. Because now going forward, uh, if California is going to reach its goal under SB 100, uh, they're going to have to look to San Diego because we'll have done it before then. Uh, and I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the next several decades of really showing uh, the California and the rest of the world uh, what global climate leadership looks like, and that's San Diego. Todd and I spent many time in like the bottom of the Tijuana River and on the beach too, so that's good. So uh, Imperial Beach is on the U.S.-Mexico border. We're 28,000 people, very much a blue-collar beach town, not proud of the 25% poverty rate, majority-minority community, very different than a lot of beach towns in Southern California, more typical of what you find on the U.S.-Mexico border. So I'm gonna just touch on three areas that we're working on and as well as with my Wild Coast hat where I, we're working to do really what the Nature Conservancy calls natural climate solutions. And the, if I can get into the, the, the conference tomorrow or today, the last panel is on uh, ocean and climate and blue carbon. I'll talk, just touch upon that briefly. So really at the city level, really what we've been doing, our big thing is addressing sea level rise thanks to the San Diego Foundation, the California Coastal Conservancy, and now the California Coastal Commission. We were able to do um, an impact, a physical, basically geophysical impact study of what sea level rise would look in our community. Unfortunately, we found that 30% of our city is going to be underwater, uh, you know, during, with storm surge and six feet of sea level rise. And now, with the new assessments, we might have to go back and change that. So, um, and then number two, thanks to the foundation, um, we were able to actually do the economic analysis. And so, that was eye-opening because just the impacts to our beachfront, and we're surrounded on three sides by water, the, the Pacific Ocean, which is a marine protected area, the south end of San Diego Bay, which is a national wildlife refuge, and then the Tijuana River Estuary, which is a national estuarine research reserve and a, a fish and wildlife service uh, refuge. Um, so just the impacts alone to our beachfront would be over $100 million. Of course, we don't have that money. It was one of those holy shit moments <laughs> that we said, right, and who's gonna help us? And the response was, no one. So that's why we are among the first city, we were the first city in the world along with San Mateo and, and Marin uh, and then Richmond and, and Santa Cruz signed on to file a lawsuit against 35 of the world's largest fossil fuel companies for causing sea level rise with uh, the firm of uh, Cher Edling which is here in San Francisco. Um, San, New York, San Francisco and Oakland signed on the lawsuit. They did their own lawsuits later, they didn't use our lawyers. Those have been thrown out of court, ours haven't. And then people ask us, why are we doing this? Are we making a statement? No, the reality is my residents can't afford to pay for sea level rise. They didn't cause it. These, com these companies should, and they should pay for it. So that's the sea level rise component. We've decided to embrace sea level rise. We're not running for it. We think our city and other cities, like Solana Beach, et cetera, are, have become leaders on this. And what's interesting in San Diego, when it comes to restoration and adaptation, there's a good collective consensus that we need to be doing this. And Carlsbad's here, Mike Sears, welcome Carlsbad. The same thing, we're looking at how can we adapt to sea level rise, how can we do restoration. That's, that's actually really productive, positive work that I'm really glad to be part of. Um, the second component of that is though, how do we become more carbon neutral, right? And we're a low income city, and so good example is our, we work with the county, tore down our old library, put up a net zero library. 
Awesome, right? If I could tear down every old building in our city and replace it with net zero buildings, I would do so. Hopefully, Todd will help us get some money. We got the housing money, <laughs> and that, no, but that's important because then we can put up more sustainable housing, right? And, and affordable housing that's a lot better than the slums that folks are living in our city. And we're trying to tear those down and get, replace them with the money that he's going to get us to put up affordable housing. <laughs> Number two, the U.S.-Mexico border. We're on the U.S.-Mexico border, the smallest city on the border. I chaired the San Diego or San Diego Association of Governments Borders Committee. Todd was on the San Diego board before he got elected to the legislature. The big thing on the border, border crossings, the largest source of, of carbon emissions in the region are probably border crossings. So working with Caltrans and the Mexican government, essentially helping negotiate these infrastructure projects to get better and smarter border crossings so that essentially heavy diesel burning trucks aren't standing for hours crossing the border, they can get across the border quickly. And then kids in my community in San Ysidro on the border don't have asthma. So that's a big thing. Uh, the second component of that obviously is water quality. Todd's helping us with that. With the Attorney General just filed a lawsuit against the, the federal government for water quality issues on the border. But the reality is from Mexico, along with Australia and the United States, one of the most drought affected areas on the planet, to be sucking water out of the Colorado River to pump it uphill, to dump it in the ocean as raw sewage is ridiculous. Now we have an Israeli company, Otis, we brought to Tijuana. They're planning on taking that raw sewage and then selling it to the wine growers in the Valle de Guadalupe. So and hopefully we can convince the Mexican government that 100% water reuse for private incentives is the way to go. And then finally, I'll end here. Blue carbon, blue carbon, blue carbon, blue carbon, natural climate solutions. What we've been saying for our climate action plan is why would we grow trees that use water in IB to reduce our, you know, quote for our natural climate solutions part of our climate action plan when we've helped preserve 17,000 acres of carbon sequestering eelgrass systems and, and chaparral and even potentially kelp forests around our city. We should get credit for that. So should Carlsbad, so should Solana Beach. We have to acknowledge every every source, every area of carbon sequestering ecosystems, not that it interferes, not that it takes away from decarbonizing the global economy, but because it's important to provide incentives for communities like ours to help protect those, just as San Diego as well. And we all want to restore them. That's what's really cool right now. There's consensus around, we're going to preserve the habitat, let's restore it, let's make it more viable, let's create those incentives to do that. And with organizations like the Port of San Diego, we're doing that. This morning, my organization, Wild Coast, was featured on national television in Mexico with the work we're doing that with blue carbon and mangroves as well. So, again, the idea for incentives is key. And uh, so I think that's what's interesting now with this the whole way with markets working and that we could actually find incentives for people to do the right thing. And I think with clean tech's really helping to do that. And for cities like ours, that is essential. So, I'm there. Great. Uh, I, I think it's great what, what Todd and Sir so far have said, uh, highlighting really the regional integration that we are. Uh, we're, we're showing and striving for. Uh, the city of Solana Beach uh, is a small city in San Diego County, um, and if you ever get a chance, uh, one of the things we're well known for is our music club, The Belly Up. You should come on out and uh, check out some of the best music in Southern California, restaurants, great beaches, and the like, and uh, you know, spend some money while you're there, of course. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the city of Solana Beach, since its inception, has had environmental sustainability as a key strategic pillar. And we, uh, we, we pioneered uh, several areas. Uh, we, we banned smoking in commercial establishments very early on. First city in the country, I think, to ban smoking on beaches. Um, first in the, in the county uh, to have a, a single-use plastic bag ban, a polystyrene a food container ban. Um, but uh, we're, we're especially proud of uh, uh, just this past June 1st, we are able to cut over to Community Choice Energy, also known as Community Choice Aggregation. And uh, of course, San Francisco, a lot of northern and central California cities have had this program, but uh, we're the first in the San Diego Gas and Electric Service Area, which includes San Diego County and part of Orange County. The, uh, we've been studying this for six years before we, uh, we, we got it. Um, it, it's an involved process, but it's critical and, and essentially, uh, if you don't know, it allows cities and by state law, cities and counties can uh, set up their own energy procurement and generation operations, often uh, with higher renewable energy content, um, and then in a, in a co competitive and cooperative relationship with the investor-owned utility, the corresponding utility 
uh, the utility still gets paid to deliver the energy onto the grid. So um, we, are, we have very aggressive targets in terms of uh, greenhouse gas uh, reduction, 100% renewable energy by 2035, and that's a key driver for us. But also, and I, as, um, I've got a little list here of things that we found especially appealing about uh, community choice energy. Uh, just the idea of having choice, and uh, sdg &E is a monopoly about 125 years uh, going, and, um, and this is a very healthy thing in, in our economy, and the cost competition and the savings we're able to, uh, to discount about, uh, right now about 2 to 3 percent in, in the electric cost versus the utility, but we see that gap widening. Uh, we've got 92 percent of our residents are in the program, uh, already accumulating savings. Uh, we're putting our default product, which is a 50% renewable element, uh, is, is higher than SDG&E's, running about 43%. But uh, like many community choice plans, our residents and businesses can opt up to a 100% renewable plan. We have many residents who are doing that. So tremendous opportunities there. And also the idea of having rate setting and local control. So our residents don't have to go to, to San Francisco or Sacramento to try to discuss rates and rate adjustments. They can just come down to City Hall, which in our, for most of our residents, about a mile or two away from where they live. And, um, and then there's the revenue stream for the city. We're projecting uh, probably right out of the gate about a million dollar surplus um, this year. And that's money that um, can be applied as the city council decides. It'll, uh, we, we have some, uh, some uh, agreements with local suppliers who are doing this turnkey for us. And we're creating financial buffers to, to have our uh, real financial security around this. But we envision dealing with uh, energy efficiency improvements, subsidies, rooftop solar for residents and businesses. It'll really be open to what the residents give us input on and what they think best. So. Uh, with that, we're real excited about it. We're also excited about where the city of San Diego and so many cities in San, in, in San Diego County are far along with this because we can only have so much impact. Hopefully, some of the pain that we've endured in this process and the relationship and sorting it out with the utility will smooth the way, perhaps, for, for some of the other plans. But we're, we really need that region-wide impact, which, which uh, I think a lot of us are optimistic is going to happen fairly soon. Uh, one more thing that we're working on, uh, maybe not so directly climate related, is uh, plastics. So our uh, Climate Action Commission, I'm, I'm a member of that commission, uh, we have recommended to the full city council some very aggressive and stringent restrictions in terms of uh, further going with plastic foodware, utensils, uh, any polystyrene, and I know that the uh, city of Imperial Beach has done some great work in this area. Well, we get a copy of what you're doing because we need to do more. Absolutely, so, I have it right with me. And, and, um, and so there's, uh, you know, even things that, and there's some great cities, uh, Malibu and Manhattan Beach and others, they're doing work on this, uh, as well as the plat disposable water bottles and what to do with those. So. San Francisco, the city has some good work. We, we've, uh, we've got some provisions mirroring theirs to at least get the city and any, any, um, any city funds not going in that direction, as well as looking at capital improvements in our parks and having more uh, potable water, more drinking water, so that we can then move closer to restrictions on those bottles, both for water and other beverages. So it's a big lift. and. Uh, with, with some luck, we'll get our full city council to, uh, to, to get behind this and, and have this implemented fairly soon. So thank you again for, uh, for having me. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Was, but he is a Republican. Um, so passing that baton and that very ambitious climate action plan that was still in a draft form, um, I think a lot of folks expected us to back off on that plan and kind of unwind some of the goals. And that's right uh, at the time when I was hired. And I asked the same thing when I was brought into the mayor's office to confirm whether I should be hired or not. Um, I said, are, are we serious about this? Because I don't want to come here and um, not do any work. Um, and we were. So um, getting that plan passed, um, it's cutting our carbon footprint in half by 2035, which is consistent with um, the latest science that says where we need to be. Um, and also uh, pushing forward things like 100% um, renewable energy by 2035. We also have an equally possibly more ambitious target around mobility and um, for Californians and especially San Diegans um, we're trying to shift 50% of commuters out of their cars alone into biking, walking or using transit 
um, and that's that's just as hard. And um, and we also have some other initiatives in there that look, at, of course, other general greenhouse gas reduction initiatives, but. Something that I found really exciting to be working on is the nexus of climate and the economy. Um, so we really focused on job creation and business um, support and technology around climate, which is why we already had a strong relationship with, with clean tech and other organizations, and that really um, kind of we doubled down on that that sort of um, relationship and mentality. The other piece of that economy is also looking at our lowest and lower income communities. And if this whole energy sector is changing so dramatically and climate change is rethinking the way we kind of do business, um, how do we include um, our lower income folks in that movement rather than leaving them behind yet again? Um, so we're actually, something I'm pretty proud of is we're hiring a, a climate equity specialist to start mm -hmm. and help, help us tackle that um, issue. They are going to have such an uphill battle <laughs> um, because Sadly, we um, are in good company, and there's a lot of cities that also are terrible at um, thinking about this stuff in the past, So, um, but it's a start, um, and they'll be working with me on all those issues. That's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, around the 100% Renewable Energy Initiative, um, we are moving forward and looking at how to get there. And I feel like it's been dragging on forever, but when you said six years, I feel much better. <laughs> um, we've been doing this about three years, <laughs> looking at how to get to 100% renewable and actually um, we'll be identifying, so not only do we adopt a goal, which is a nice thing, cities love to do that, um, but we are laying out a strategy for how to get there. How, what does that roadmap look like? Um, and we'll be um, uh, identifying that in the coming weeks. One of the outlying pieces of data we are waiting on is um, the city of San Diego. We're about 40 to 50% of our utilities load. So if we uh, leave and form a community choice aggregation or some other, other program with the utility even, there's a whole lot of contracts that were purchased on our behalf that we still have to pay for. Um, and so we are waiting on a key decision for um, what, that, what that calculation looks like. To, it's, a, it's a huge piece of the financials of this decision, which is coming out in a couple weeks. Um, so that's exciting as well. Um, and, you know, it's funny, when I started working on this issue and I was talking to the energy company, they were like, oh, transportation is a bigger source of your emissions. Go talk to the, you know, our regional transit agencies and, and the planning agency, Sandag. And then I'd go talk to Sandag and they're like, oh, they should, you should go talk to the energy company. They're, you know, they're, they're a bigger piece of your pie. Um, and it really takes all of these things. I mean, if you think about cutting your own carbon footprint in half in 18, 17 years, I mean, if you really think about that, that's really hard to do. Um, so doing it at the city level is, um, it's a big lift, um, so it takes kind of a lot of infrastructure changes, behavior changes, um, but it's, it's exciting, it's super exciting to be working on this right now. There's so many issues to be tackling, the enthusiasm um, from, from residents who don't really care about greenhouse gas emissions but can get behind things like having more trees on their streets or having options for how to get to work rather than feeling they have to drive alone. Um, those types of things are exciting. The last thing I'll end on, I feel like Nicola's going to touch on it more, is um, that we in San Diego tend to be really collaborative. Um, we feel like we go farther together, um, and we've worked for years now, for 10 years, we, we've been working together on, on a regional collaborative of um, sharing ideas. So how can we, how can you learn from me? How can we share what we've done with each other so we're not reinventing the wheel and we're leveraging the funds that we do get? Um, and I think that's been one of our kind of keys to success in San Diego. So, and it's something I'm particularly proud of, and it's and I enjoy. Um, so I'll leave it to that. I'm sure Q and A will, will bring out some more questions. But thank you. Uh, at the San Diego Foundation, you know, we are a community foundation. There's 700 odd of us across the country. Who would who would know? Uh, I'm always kind of astounded that there's so many um, serving the San Diego region. And we were one of the first to launch a uh, an initiative focus um, on climate change. And uh, you know, it's with that, that early on we realized there's a lot that we could do um, to really help catalyze greater regional action on the issue of climate change um, by working with cities and, and with municipalities and looking at policy and, and doing things a little differently than we had done as a community foundation before. Um, than maybe our kind of annual competitive you know, grants programs in certain areas. So um, it was really um, exciting to get to work um, really at the, the initial stages. Um, I know um, one of our, uh, I, 
my mentors has been one of our panelists, uh, uh, better half, sorry, Serge, <laughs> um, who uh, really started our um, our climate work and our environment initiatives. Um, and uh, you know, since since we launched that, um, we've really helped to drive. Um, a lot of collaboration in um, getting better data for decision making. Um, so working with institutions like Scripps Institution of Oceanography, uh, many other universities, the University of San Diego, um, and others to help try to um, both fund, uh, where, we, where we do have funds, um, research and science that can inform decision making, also bring some of these folks together, help be a little bit of a glue um, and a bridge to help, um, help take some of what we have known for so long in the science community um, to decision makers and working with cities and working with uh, partners like um, like we have in the last few years, uh, climate education partners um, led out of the University of San Diego um, to really, again, try to bring that data uh, and that science um, around different issues that spanned, you know, uh, different, uh, some of the um, sort of impacts um, that Margaret spoke about in terms of, of sea level rise um, or wildfire or heat. Um, also, you know, we funded some of the first regional greenhouse gas emissions inventories that, you know, our metropolitan planning organizations now using to inform their planning. Um, you know, we funded some of the first um, emissions inventories for the cities um, and, um, you know, really looked at that um, focus on data and science early. And then to Cody's point, we've really looked at, you know, we have uh, we have some resources, but but they are modest, you know, and they are modest in the scope and scale of the challenge that we face. So we've really looked at how can we invest in things that will affect and, and support many different agencies, many different cities. And so we've really appreciated the fact that cities have come together, um, you know, through entities like we now have a San Diego Regional Climate Collaborative, where cities, uh, you know, folks in the room, um, I think all the three, definitely the three cities up here are members, um, and um, it is really a, a venue to help um, translate more quickly a lot of the successes. Hey, what's not worked? Let's talk about that um, where we can as well, um, and 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 a lot of the the strategies and tactics um, that that cities and agencies can take collectively. So that's been. Um, really exciting um, and I think a really great um, uh, uh, be beacon I think of leadership for our region and how we've been able to work together. I would also say you know we've also supported as kind of more the bread and butter of, non of a foundation uh, nonprofit um, work and community engagement and, and so that's taken different forms over the years um, but you know nonprofits do play a really critical role in making uh, uh, possible the community to get engaged um, in helping to support and provide the kind of the community um, input and voice into and support of a lot of these policies and also helping to carry them through um, and implement them and so they are really a critical aspect and just the landscape of nonprofits um, that are focused on this issue in San Diego has you know very excitingly flourished in the last five years um, many of those who are you know particularly Active may not have been even around uh, uh, five five years ago, and then there's others um, who have stuck with this issue um, over many years, and it is really exciting to see. Um, but I would say similar to our business community in San Diego, you know, we have a lot of small nonprofits. Like we have, uh, you know, an economy made up of really largely a lot of small businesses, and so um, you know, investing in their their health and capacity is really important as well. Um, I would say um, just, uh, you know, we can talk a little bit more about that in the Q&A, but I think philanthropy overall, um, you know, we're, again, we're, a, we're a, a, a small fish in terms of foundations um, swimming in this um, kind of movement to see to promote climate action. Um, but it is really exciting to see the level, um, just through different funder groups that I'm a part of, of commitment from foundations. I know part of the summit they're going to be talking about, um, I they started it saying, I heard last week, some $2 billion in commitments that foundations are expected to invest in these issues um, globally um, within the next five years. And I think that's grown, and we'll hear more about that this week. But um, it is really exciting. And uh, at the foundation, you know, we certainly want to um, continue to be a partner and continue to feel, um, to, to find ways that we can help 
um, either catalyze or scale up solutions or connect the dots um, where some of that collaboration uh, is timely and, um, and, and also can be challenging without you know, some, some extra glue or time um, or will to, to make happen. So uh, thank you. Organizations represented here has collaborated with us mm -hmm. and every one of these individuals has collaborated with us and it's that ecosystem that really makes it, it happen. Mm -hmm. And the second comment is, I have been extremely disappointed with the national coverage of this summit, mm -hmm. talking about the fact that, uh, you know, so what about subnational? You know, so a bunch of people got together, and, uh, you know, if you don't have the heads of state here to say, my country is in, uh, nothing goes forward. What you heard was that the action is at this level. This is where it happens. It doesn't happen because uh, a president or a prince or a, uh, whatever stands up and says, we'll do it. It happens because the community, these people convince the community that in the landscape of all of the other problems and issues that everybody's concerned with day to day, this is important to invest in for the future and for our kids. And that's, that's the real message of subnational. That's where it's happening. There's amazing researchers, usually we're on the beach like with Bob Guza without any shoes on, <laughs> right? Or in the field on a boat with Octavio Berto or um, with Falk Federson, you know, um, on, on, but we have this access. But in addition to USD, you know, San Diego with Michelle Boudreau here mm -hmm. and San Diego State, um, but at the end of the day, you always find yourself with Dr. Monk. And, and you might be a little depressed because things are getting hard. And he basically summarizes it by saying, don't make excuses about what you can't do. And there's nothing that a small group of people who are committed and passionate can't carry out. So thank you, Dr. Monk, for always your inspiration and your legacy of achievement and partnership with people doing cool stuff and trying to change the world. So I appreciate that. That makes a big difference for me and I know a lot of us. So anyway. Why we're going to be here today. We were really excited. All of us got a, we geeked out a little bit that you were going to be here. So thanks for joining us. Have debates, political debates, informed by that overview of what's going on on this planet and immediately behind the candidates as they speak, show the real data. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about fake news or fact checking or anything. It's right there for everybody. Then, then you can really get to making better decisions because what's happening here is the ecosystem that Scripps has created in the, in the San Diego region is what's helping you guys collaborate because you've got all these students and professors, <coughs> part of the community, and they're contributing to the community and then contributing to the decision making that's allowing us to go forward. So thank you. The institutions themselves have been models for sustainability. Uh, USD has done tremendous work, uh, UC San Diego of course, uh, um, San Diego State is really coming along and not only educating the students and, and having a great uh, cadre of professors and professionals, but actually putting, putting it into action. And, and that's what I think the cities have been able to benefit from as well. So I know even, uh, even in Solana Beach, we have certain residents from SIO and who've come into our Climate Action Commission and helped educate uh, the commissioners, the council members. Uh, and so we've had various people from universities. And then seeing the young people really grab onto this is so critical, of course, for if we're really going to solve this thing, right, for future generations. So, uh, it, it, it's, it's indispensable, the role of education. And what I also love to see is programs that are coming up in all of our universities that are uh, sustainability certificates and, and other programs which are feeding into our workforce and the needs of our workforce as they're becoming more sustainable. So this ecosystem is really a critical component, that education side. I could, I could add a little bit to that too. The San Diego Unified School District is one of the largest school districts, um, in the largest school district in San Diego, and they actually, I don't know if it's adopted yet, but they have a, I believe it is, a climate action plan that's probably as ambitious as ours, um, right? So um, I think they're instituting that themselves, and I, I would guess, I go to high schools and, and, uh, and lower levels all the time to talk whenever I can, and I would guess that probably everybody up here, just because of the, the 
the amount that we care about what we're doing, I bet we all do that as well. For example, Bob Guzman, Falk Federson, doing, Falk has been doing uh, research on ocean cur uh, currents in, off of Imperial Beach. We're using a tool that he have, he's developed, they've developed a scripts for tracking ocean currents to help us open and close beaches faster due to uh, border pollution. But Scripps has been really great, and other institutions, USD and San Diego State, uh, UCSD, have been great at really had these collaborative <coughs> partnerships with cities as well and institutions so that you actually get the community engaged in, in the science kind of events, you know, in a silly way. It's, it's really, really, really great. And as well, you have that great new master's program. I've got three staff, three Scripps master's graduates on my staff at Wild Coast. So it's awesome to see the role these, oh, this new program is really. Um, really bringing to the table in San Diego in terms of policy making. But I, I think the amount of applied research and collaboration I think is, is <coughs> crucial when you're a small city like ours or a big city like San Diego and really get, getting access to, to really to, to science. You know. yeah. This climate education partnership project which really brought together um, behavioral psychologists, communications experts with um, scientists <coughs> from different <coughs> universities and it really um, <coughs> You know, through a lot of the the the, the research and, and data, public opinion polling, focus groups, you know, really learning that um, data is essential, um, and it is also not enough. You know, that we also we can't um, more data and more data and more data won't um, you know be enough. We also need to also appeal to people through their identity. You know, how do we as San Diegans? What are our, our values? You know, around innovation and around. Um, a healthy environment and a strong economy um, and you know really making sure that as we're communicating about these that we're really appealing to people's identity um, their their values and also a sense of you know we can do something about this while there's a lot of great things that we can we can champion we also we still have a long way to go as I think you know everyone here would 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 underscore um, and we, we but but we can really leverage the fact that we've done a lot and so that was you know I think a really helpful aspect and really changed a lot of you know how we communicated um, uh, you know our work um, and and some of the ways that that we've worked with others um, and you know just as an organization too um, through complementary programs you know we do invest a lot in in education around um, um, also diversifying the pipeline of youth that are in STEM fields and really making sure that as a region, you know, we're, we're, we're building and ensuring that, you know, the access to education and all these amazing resources is really shared among the, the community because we've seen that backlash. Um, uh, well, it's important for so many reasons and just the more people feel left out of these changes and these innovations, um, you know, that's going to cause a lot of, a lot of problems. Um, um, you know, and, and, and widen a lot of gaps that we already have um, in terms of affordability in San Diego. So a lot, a lot more to do and, um, you know, a lot um, more to do with, with definitely um, ensuring that that next generation um, is empowered because um, we, we've also heard from, 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 from folks up here in terms of um, elected officials and others that um, it is future generations. You know, I don't have a, a clear one image for you, but when, when we asked leaders what, what changes their minds um, and why they're doing this work, most of them said it was for, it was for that next generation. So in many respects, that's kind of the... <laughs> so I get to interact with children quite a bit, more than, I, more than my guess, just given the school presentations, interns, you know, every semester. Um, those, are, those are young adults, not children. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them are still in high school. <laughs> Extremely passionate, and they look at me if I have a water ball in my hand, like I'm a part of the problem, right? Um, they, it's kind of ingrained in them already. It probably goes back to some of that imagery and the fact they were raised, the kids that saw that image then, were, this is who's raised them. I think the challenges I see are probably two things, and it's somewhat duplicative of what Nicola just said, is number one, how do you sustain that interest so that they go on to work in that field? Not all, but, but enough that actually can. And Serge and I were on the, uh, in La Jolla Shores the other uh, few weeks ago uh, with some young people from South of Interstate 8 um, who were experiencing the beach, sadly, not as often as probably, not all the first time, I think there was one that was first time, but the um, point is that the, uh, how, what sort of programming, like what Serge is doing, Ocean Discovery Institute, some of these incredible nonprofit organizations that are really finding these young people who have an aptitude and an interest and giving them the ability to engage on it and kind of fi find their way so that they can help find solutions professionally. But the other piece of it is to the extent there ever is a, a young person who isn't engaged on this issue, it has more to do with social equity, not a, not a lack of desire, interest, or passion. Um, and so, you know, if, if they're 
uh, and this gets to about what Cody was talking about within the climate action plan. So I would I would ask you to maybe just sort of think of it differently and not from a PR perspective. I think the interest is inherently there, and the barriers are more uh, on us to create either the, the career pathways, the educational pathways, and then certainly to provide the equity that allows them to actually engage uh, in the clean economy that we're trying to build. Now, I want to remind you, I think the greatest improvement of scripts happened. We used to have sort of a understanding that girl students couldn't go out on, on our ships because we already had a male head. And, and I think the greatest improvement was when our toilets were became bisexual. <laughs> I, I'd like to tell you a little story. We had a visit when uh, Nienberg was director by the Queen and Prince Philip. And Nienberg took the Queen out and showed off, our, showed off our pier, or the splendid pier we had. I was assigned to, to, to accompany Philip. It was much more fun, actually. <laughs> and Philip got a long 45-minute lecture on climate. And I waited outside the room. I didn't want to disturbed he came out and he wiped his head. He said, Jesus, he said, I didn't know all that. We already knew in Britain that our climate is going to be beastly. He used the word beastly. And I've never forgotten that. Or fires in Brentwood or in Santa Rosa, unfortunately, and they keep coming, or Hurricane Florence or Hurricane Pat in Mexico, Hurricane Patricia, the largest hurricane ever in the Eastern Pacific that luckily landed in an area where I was just at last year in Chamala Bias Reserve, which sort of forced all flattened, but it didn't destroy uh, communities. And so that becomes the imagery that at least on their adaptation and resiliency side, has really paved the, the way that all of a sudden people are like, and again, I, Mike's here from Carlsbad and Solana Beach and San Diego are like, yeah, restoration, bring it on. Like, why are we gonna even fight over the whole flood control management? We can't wait to do that. So I think, that's, that's at least been helpful on the climate change and carbon emissions part with the fake news stuff. That's harder, and that's we have to figure that out. But at least I, I find that's been uh, helpful on the resiliency side where you can say, everybody can get around the table and say, all right, we want to deal with coastal flooding, even the old school sort of folks that don't want to talk about climate science, but they they get it that things are changing. So I think that's helpful. Yeah. So becoming the philanthropic sector mm -hmm. as well, and I think um, you know just from our perspective, you know, seeing more um, organizations um, being vocal on these issues, um, also um, you know adopting um, whether they're a clean tech type of business or not, um, greater CSR corporate social responsibility efforts. Um, investing in employee engagement and their ability to volunteer, matching you know gifts, um, all of that really plays a difference. We have also you know, partnered with different corporate entities to do their grant making, um, and and also just investing in also the nonprofit partners that you know really are out there also you know working with city government that are helping to uh, make way and create the policy that can help your technologies or your industries really thrive. I think is. Um, is a great um, additional way that I'm sure will complement some of the other ways that, that folks have, have said or um, would share. Increasing the proportion of uh, electric vehicles, alternative fuel vehicle miles traveled, um, and the, the power of workplace EV charger deployment is so enormous. And so uh, that's something that you know, any workplace uh, pretty much can, can really help with and allow their employees to be very friendly with those policies because the, the impact is, uh, is enormous. The other uh, thing I was going to add is that uh, one of the two companies that Solana Beach has contracted out to run our Community Choice <coughs> Program is a local San Diego company, Calpine. And uh, they do terrific work not only in Solana Beach and in our region, but throughout the state and other areas, and especially with this Community Choice area. Right. Peter actually was just talking about, you know, um, EV charging stations, there's been a ton of bills on trying to remove barriers to actually allowing that to happen, whether that's liability or you know, where you put the meter, what, so on and so forth. And some of this may be known to all of you, it's sort of obvious perhaps an observation, but the best ideas come from the community, you know, best ideas for bills. Um, we all get the opportunity to introduce 50. I did 12 this year because I don't think everything needs law. Um, but you have the opportunity to introduce legislation 
Uh, I think innovators, the people who are really at the tip of the spear, really coming up with new ideas and whatnot, they're so busy innovating, they may not know that the barrier they're up against could be changed through a legislative action or a city council action. And that disconnect, you know, can, I think sometimes drag out uh, things that we need uh, done, you know, swiftly. Um, and hopefully you and everyone in this room would know, hey, give give us a call, we're here, right? This is where the ideas should come from. Um, and to the extent that individuals don't feel empowered, groups like Clean Tech San Diego often serve that role as well. Um, you don't need a fancy lobbyist, you can just simply be in touch through an, or an association or through individuals, but give us those ideas. Those ideas are usually the far more rewarding bills to carry. You know, if you're gonna have to go and twist arms and beg the governor for a signature, <laughs> you know, do it on behalf of a righteous cause that could help take a small idea and really scale it up to be a true solution for a community. Um, that's what I get reward, uh, enjoyment from. I imagine that's true for Surgeon, for uh, for Peter. So you know, please know that you, you can give us the ideas, whatever challenge you're facing. Um, if it happens to be a result of regulation or why not, come to us. That's what we're here to help with. Was the city of San Diego was the business community, the mayor at the time, really bringing these organizations together and honestly not giving us a choice, saying and that this was a philanthropic support too, and philanthropic, yeah. But, but this was a priority for the region, and it really at the time was an environment. It wasn't an environmental priority. It was an economic priority, right? Yes. Um, and it became, you know, I would say even just in the last five years, our organization has really been focused on what Scripps is doing more than we ever have. Um, but really bringing these kind of partners together to say this is an interesting opportunity, economic opportunity for our region, let's really catalyze this um, and create an organization to do that. Uh, but I do think you know, there's obviously leadership in this region, uh, but there's very focused leadership in the San Diego region. And I think the fact that UCSD and SDSU and USD and Scripps all kind of sit around the table together um, is beneficial for our region. You know, I, I, it's mostly been stolen conversations, uh, you know, sort of on the sidelines of, of the event. And, you know, I don't know, it gives me hope. There's a lot of stuff going on. I, I think for San Diego, uh, probably the, uh, Cody was getting to it, our transportation network has to change. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a current situation where uh, the, the money is flowing through an organization that really is uh, internally struggling uh, with what I think <coughs> people want versus what the politics are currently demanding, if that makes sense. So, um, you know, just even looking at this transit center across the street, I mean, that's that's pretty amazing. Sadly, I don't know that that could happen today in San Diego, but it probably needs to, right? Yeah. So I think that's it. And then I have what, maybe just turn it a little slightly, I haven't found anyone really talking about that they're doing the right stuff on housing. Um, and that's another piece of this puzzle. Um, we need to bring, I, I, I wish there was a Walter Monk of housing, right? Someone who would come in and be an innovator and a disruptor and really find a new way to do it um, because we can do the energy generation piece and I'm actually becoming much more um, optimistic on that front, but it's the housing and transportation piece that's keeping me up nights and like I said, I've heard some good stuff about transit, transportation that I dubious under the current circumstances we could do in San Diego and I'm not hearing enough about housing and how important that is for climate. Amazingly brilliant, passionate, happy people, positive people who actually, right, who's, who don't make excuses, who don't talk about what they can't do, we're all about what they can do, and that's what, that's the fuel, you know, it's not about money, at least when you're a small city and a, a non-profit, there is no money, so that's the fuel that keeps me going, and I know our team, right, and I'm going to give just kudos to Jason, you asked about, you know, how the private sector, I don't meet anyone that really hasn't, what the, 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 and you, San Francisco, the honest broker model is, Jason just tells somebody to go talk to Surge and IB and IB and help them. It's not about you can make money. It's like, hey, these guys need help. And we have lots of conversations like that. So thanks, Jason, for being that honest broker. It's just always about, or anybody else here, it's just it's about helping pe make things better. So anyway. Thank you. Actions yesterday, one of them was uh, the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance. And uh, you may have been there, uh, uh, Cody. And a lot of sustainability officers who are really sharp from around the world, Australia and Yokohama, Japan. and. Uh, city of Boulder has really uh, taken with their, uh, some of the things they're dealing with and, and made suggestions on was the, the funding to fuel these initiatives. You know, I, I look at our city and how, mu how ambitious we are and the ambitions of a lot of you up here and, and the climate action plans you see. Who's going to do all this work and, and how are we going to really meet these aggressive targets? So there are some really uh, interesting comments about ways that they are raising funds, whether it's the private sector or, or public. And um, that, that, I think, is a key issue, you know, as, as we're embarking down this road. And, and there's just a great opportunity to, to share best practices uh, around that. So uh, that's something that really struck me. 
when I go to other cities like this, um, I definitely am envious of the transit opportunities that they have here and hearing all the conversation. What I'm not envious of and I'm just happy to see is how excited everybody is, the, the buzz that you feel and how much people are just, even though these are monumental challenges we're all talking about and thinking about, that there is excitement and passion and, and while we don't have the Native American with the tear, I think when I work with kids or anybody, people are, are see solutions and see ways to overcome the challenges and don't just get bogged down in the depression of, of how awful the future looks for us. It actually looks bright and they see opportunity and, and that kind of, I think, percolates up to us rather than us down to them. So um, there's a lot of cool ideas. I'm jealous of their philanthropic money up here too and I think Nickel probably is too. <laughs> um, I'd love to see some of that come down to San Diego. Um, but I think we have such a great backbone and structure that we're working with in San Diego. So we're, we're doing it um, in a much more scrappy way. So to elevate the voice and what's happening here in San Diego um, without trying to sound like a bitter uh, squeaky wheel, you know, but really elevating the, the um, you know, the innovation that's happening here, the opportunity and how we've scaled up solutions just within our region of, of 18 different cities um, and, and the county. Um, sometimes I feel like collaboration can have us selling ourselves short too like we can you know put in one application because we think it would be way more successful that way and then you see four applications coming in from the bay area and um you know mm -hmm. then they're like oh well there must be so much interest and in how can we just spun two there and and san diego yeah. misses out yeah. so sometimes you know um, you know being bold and making sure that we are also um you know really um uh, giving ourselves and our communities, you know, the credit and the importance um, in terms of our size and 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 the needs, um, you know, it's that fine balance. Um, and then just another thing, you know, yesterday I was at a meeting um, that was for some philanthropic organizations of, you know, grassroots advocates of um, indigenous communities from the Amazon. Probably many of the folks that are protesting and, um, you know, not, you know, right at the door of the summit and it really feeling like, you know, these communities, um, one, haven't been at the table with solutions, um, that these solutions are working against their interests and, you know, just really I think a sense of urgency for us all as we continue to make sure that, you know, as we've seen waves similarly at the national level of people really feeling like I am left out, I am left out. Um, how can we make sure that as a region we do that differently and we, um, you know, including myself, I feel like there's a lot more that I can do and continue to learn from, from <laughs> other, um, other successes around. Yeah, you know, there's both the population and the governmental uh, oomph that's here. And uh, I keep thinking, you know, look south and see what's going on there because it's, uh, uh, you know, just a fabulous uh, success story uh, for this area that I wish uh, I have envy that we, we don't get out as well as we as some other areas. Our story, uh, we believe we have a really good one. This has been noted several times today. Um, we spend a lot of time outside of our region talking about our region, and rightfully so. Um, so we appreciate you taking the time as part of this busy week to be here. Uh, Laura, thank you again to Perkins Cooey for hosting us. Please help me thank all of my panelists. Uh, for as you spend the rest of the time here that you have that warm fuzzy feeling that there's a lot of good people all over the world doing the right thing um, I think collectively we all will have an impact um, so thank you all for being a part of that a part of that warm fuzzy feeling thank you very much <laughs>